Hi, welcome to the channel Coders Arc, where we unravel the world of coding and architecture together. And today I'm going to talk about solid design principles. Solid design principles must make the core DNA of every developer and an architect. So whether it's you preparing for an interview or learning about the content material for the very first time, or even refreshing your memory, I will do my best to make sure that you understand and absorb the material thoroughly and never be able to forget it through some visuals and code snippets. So let's dive right into it. Here are the five solid design principles and solid stands for the beginning letter of each principle, which I've highlighted. Single responsibility principle, open closed principle, Liskov substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. Let's look at each one of those in a little bit more detail. Single responsibility principle. It states that a class should have only one reason to change, meaning that a class should have a very specific responsibility or a job. Let's unpack it through an example. Look at the bank account management class. It has various management functionalities like checking account management, savings account management, retirement account management, credit card, promotions and coupons, investments, online accounts, credentials management, etc. Now, if all of these functionalities were implemented inside one class, it would be a very big monolithic class that will have a lot of properties and methods in any time the functionality changes in one of these sub modules, the entire banking management class would have to be changed. Now imagine if this class is used in several places in the code, that means wherever the code is using this class, the, those classes will also have to change. So you can imagine the problem with this. We need to break it down into some meaningful chunks so that it becomes easier to maintain and reuse the code. So let's see how the single responsibility principle will break it down. The whole bank account management class is now broken into its own sub modules like checking account management will be its own class. Savings account management will be its own class. Credit cards, promotions, coupons, investments, online accounts, retirement accounts, all of them will have their own individual classes because they're implementing of pieces of functionality that are closely related. So hopefully that clearly illustrates a single responsibility principle. The second principle is the open closed principle, which states that a class should be open for extension and closed for modification. Let's take a closer look at it through an example. In this example, we have a bank account management class, which has the functionalities for withdraw, deposit and check balance. Now imagine this bank supports two types of accounts, a checking account and a savings account. Now if you were to implement all of that functionality for checking and saving account inside this base class, it might be okay. But what if we want to extend it to have more accounts like retirement account, or an investment account very soon, implementing all of the functionality in the base class would become quite cumbersome. So what we propose through the open close principle is allow the capabilities for child classes to extend the functionality of the base class. In this, you can see that the savings account management and checking account management would be the subclasses and they will extend the functionality of withdraw, deposit, and check balance. They will have their own functionalities of withdraw, deposit, and check balance. So this is open close principle in a nutshell. The next principle is the Liskov substitution principle, which states that the derived classes or subclasses must be substitutable for their base classes or superclasses without affecting the correctness of the program. Let's take a closer look at it through an example. In this example, let's take another look at the bank account management class, which has five methods, withdraw, deposit, check balance, notification management, 
address management. Now the child classes savings account and check account management only want to override the functionality for the withdraw and deposit methods from the base class. So in a language like C sharp, there are certain keywords that help achieve the Liskov substitution principle, virtual and override. Virtual keyword in the base class indicates that its functionality can be overridden by a child class and the override keyword inside the child class indicates that functionality is going to be overridden. Let's take a look at it through a code snippet. In this code snippet, I have highlighted the bank account in red to indicate the Liskov substitution principle, which states that the child classes must be substitutable by their base classes. So in this example, you can see I've created the instances of savings account and checking account using the base class keyword. And here I can perform the method withdraw on them, even though they are bank account instances, they are actually using the functionality of the savings and checking account withdraw methods, which are overridden. Hopefully that's, this explains the Liskov substitution principle. The next principle is the interface segregation principle, which states make fine grained interfaces that are client specific. Clients should not be forced to implement interfaces they do not use. Let's take a closer look at the interface segregation principle through an example. In this example, there is an iWorker interface that has three method definitions, eat, sleep, and do work. Now it is implemented by two different worker types, robot and human. The robot does not eat or sleep, but does the work. The human eats, sleeps, and does the work. So it makes sense for human to implement the iWorker methods, but it does not make sense for the robot to implement eat and sleep method from the iWorker interface. So, how does interface segregation principle come to the rescue? Now, we split the functionality of the original iWorker interface into three different interfaces. iWorkable, iEatable, iSleepable. Where each new interface only implements one method, do work, eat and sleep respectively. So, now the robot class only implements the iWorkable interface but the human class implements iWorkable, iEatable, and iSleepable. So that's how interface segregation works. One key thing to note here is that this example is very simple. In general, you don't want to break down interfaces or segregate them to only have one or two methods. You want to meaningfully break down the functionality where it makes sense so that closely related functionalities are in one interface. So that's the principle of interface segregation principle. And finally, we have the dependency inversion principle, which states that high level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. Additionally, abstractions should not depend on details. Instead, details should depend on abstractions. Let's unpack this through an example. In this example, let's take a closer look on the left hand side first. You can see an account manager class, which is a high level module class. A high level module class is a class that contains instances of low level module classes, which in this case is checking account and savings account. Now let's take a closer look on the right hand side. On the right hand side, you can see the public class account manager. It contains two private properties for savings account and checking account. And then if you take a closer look at the perform transaction method, it has a Boolean flag is savings account and it performs a very specific business logic implementation for a savings account deposit or withdraw and then a checking account deposit or withdraw. As you can see, this introduces tight coupling between the low level modules and high level modules and this is not the most optimal way to write code. How would we solve it through dependency inversion principle?
Now, before I show you the code for how dependency inversion principle works, let's take a conceptual look at it through a visual. Here, we have a new interface, iAccount, with the deposit and withdraw methods, and now both high-level modules as well as the low-level modules are going to depend on this interface. The high-level module is going to contain an instance of this interface, and the low-level modules are going to implement the methods in this interface which shows that the high-level modules and low-level modules don't have tight coupling anymore. Instead, they depend on the abstractions, which is the interface in this case. Now, let's take a look at the code. Now, before you take a closer look at the code, I encourage you to pause the video at various steps so you can understand the dependency inversion principle in depth while taking a closer look at the code. So first, we have the public interface I account, which has two methods, deposit and withdraw. Then we have the lower level modules, savings account and checking account classes that implement the withdraw and deposit methods from the I account interface. Then we have the higher level module account manager. If you take a closer look at it, it does not implement the interface. Instead, it contains an instance of the interface. And in the constructor, you're passing the interface to it. At runtime, you will supply the lower level module classes using the principle of dependency injection into the constructor. And then if you take a closer look at the perform transaction method, you can see it's much more simplified and it does not really depend on the concrete implementations of the savings account or the checking account class anymore. And finally, we have the main method. I encourage you to pause the video at this screen and take a much closer look at the code as it is very, very important. The first two lines of code indicate the lower level modules are being initialized. If you remember, both of these lower level modules have their own implementations of the interface methods, withdraw and deposit. Then next, we use the dependency injection to provide the account to the manager. Here, if you remember, the high level module account manager uses dependency injection to take the lower level modules. And finally, they're able to perform the transactions. Again, the perform transaction method from the previous screen is much more simplified because of the loose coupling instead of the tight coupling before dependency inversion principle. So I hope now that you have a very clear understanding of the solid design principles. If you found the value in this content useful, please hit the subscribe or like button and goodbye for now.